The search for religious liberty was also a defining factor in the settlement of the middle colonies, especially in Quaker Colony of Pennsylvania. In this unit, we will look at how religious liberty shaped the middle colonies. Like the Puritans, the Religious Society of Friends were also an English group of religious dissenters. Nicknamed Quakers for the way they uh, shook when they were under deep religious emotion, the Society of Friends practiced Anabaptism or adult baptism and had run headlong into conflict with the government and Church of England. Quakers refused to pay taxes to the Anglican Church. The rebuke of expensive and extravagant cathedrals of the Catholic and Anglican churches can be seen in their simple clapboard meeting houses. They had no paid clergy or hierarchy within their church structure, but instead participated in worship democratically by speaking up when the spirit moved them. Furthermore, they rebuffed British tradition by acknowledging no rank of a superior simply referring to everyone, including their betters, as thee or thou, instead of sir or my lord. Out of, divorce, out of devotion to Jesus' teaching, to turn the other cheek, the Quakers were pacifists, meaning they refused to serve in the military, even upon threat of execution. And because the Bible says, swear no oaths, Quakers refused to sign oaths of loyalty to the crown or to swear off loyalty to the Catholic Church, a common practice in England during the 17th century. Quakers were simple, devoted, democratic people, contending for religious and civic freedom. Their high ideals attracted the devotion of a young aristocrat named William Penn, who used his fortune and fame to, uh, to secure a charter from King Charles to take his band of religious misfits and colonize the wilderness south of New York and west of the Delaware River. Naming it Pennsylvania or Penn's Woodland, the king chartered the Quaker colony in 1681. Penn is... Naming it Pennsylvania, or Penn's Woodland, the king chartered the Quaker colony in 1681. Penn is often considered the first American advertiser because he funded an extensive advertisement campaign to recruit tradesmen to his new land. Quakers, or Friends, were renowned for their simplicity in their architecture, dress, manner, and speech. They also distinguished themselves from most other Protestant denominations by allowing women to speak in the Quaker meetings and to share in making decisions for the church and the family. Penn's efforts to recruit a population for Pennsylvania was made easier by the presence of several thousand squatters that had beat him to the new colony. In honor for the colony's diversity, Penn named the colony capital Philadelphia, which is Greek for city of brotherly love. The Quakers even extended brotherly love to the native people, paying their chief Tammany a fair price for the land. Pennsylvanians were able to walk into native communities unarmed. There were even reports that Quakers would hire Indians as servants and babysitters. Penn's Treaty by Edward Hicks. This peace-loving Quaker found, uh, founder of Pennsylvania made a serious effort to live in harmony with the Indians as this treaty signing scene illustrates, but the westward thrust of white settlement eventually caused friction between the two groups, as in other colonies. Eventually, the multicultural policies of Pennsylvania would be the undoing of Penn's gentle Indian policy. 
Scotch-Irish, a misnamed group of Irish Protestants, would employ the infamous Irish tactics on the native populations as they settled in the wilderness of Western Pennsylvania, seeking land of their own. But on the whole, Penn's experiment proved to be unusually liberal for the time period. Landowners, regardless of their religion, were allowed to elect members of the colony's general assembly. The colony's charter protected all people's rights to worship as they saw fit and created no tax-supported church. No one was required to serve in the military and immigration to the colony was made easy. Even Pennsylvania's penal system was progressive, reserving the death penalty for only murder and treason. By comparison, 17th century England had a laundry list of over 200 crimes that were punishable by death. It should have been no surprise that the early sparks of abolition It should be no surprise that the early sparks of the abolition movement began in Pennsylvania too. The Quakers were shrewd business people, and by 1700, the colony had become the third largest colony in population and in wealth. Penn spent only four years in the colony before bickering amongst his colonial governors drove him back to England. Once there, his friendly relationship with the Catholic King James II landed him in prison for treason. William Penn would die a troubled and indebted man, unaware of the lasting impact he would have on the birth of a new nation. The sanctuary William Penn provided Quakers in North America would allow this sect of Protestants to grow in numbers and in influence. 10 years, after a pair of nobles were given domain over the territory of New Jersey, the Quakers bought both sections, intending to extend Pennsylvania to the Atlantic coastline. But Queen Anne would prevent that from happening by naming it with the Royal Charter instead in 1702. The rural territory of Delaware uh, had been given a lawmaking body in 1703, but would share a governor with Pennsylvania until the American Revolution. In conclusion, the middle colonies, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania shared certain economic and cultural elements. Because of their fertile soil, the middle colonies became the bread colonies of North America. The river systems of the uh, Susquehanna and the Delaware and the Hudson made the middle colonies the fur trading epicenter for the British Empire. And the bustling seaports of New York and Philadelphia were only rivaled by that of Boston. In both geography and in character, the middle colonies were midway points between New England and southern plantations. With the exception of aristocratic New York, the middle colonies were established by landholders with intermediate sized claims. Their communities were less diffused than the, than the South, but not nearly as familiar as the personalized town meetings of New England. Artisan manufacturers, not commercial merchants and plantation owners were the standard in the middle colonies. The middle colonies could be called the most American colonies of the British North America. They were more ethnically diverse, religiously tolerant, and politically balanced of all the other colonies. Because of their comparative late arrival, land was easy to acquire there at the end of the 17th century, and thus a greater sense of social equality existed. Regardless of geographic location, by the end of the 17th century, America was coming to life. All of the American colonies were flourishing under Britain's continuing hands-off policy of salutary neglect.